Ladies and gentlemen, Fight Bananas presents Coffee and KO's podcast. We're crazy about fights and jacked on caffeine. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Coffee and KOs, presented by Fight Bananas. And this is actually our first show with a sponsorship as well. This episode is going to be brought to you by Sheath Underwear. Make sure you guys go check out Sheath Underwear at sheathunderwear.com. Use promo code Coffee or yeah, Coffee and KOs, and uh, you'll get twenty percent off your order. It's a great product, great feeling. Uh, Words really can't describe it. You got to try it out to really to really know what it's all about. So make sure you sheath your dagger and go get uh, some sheath underwear. Steve, how we doing? I'm um, doing pretty good. Is uh, did my audio come out okay there? My mic just kind of tripped up on my end. Does that sound okay? You're fine. Okay, just checking in. But yeah, I'm doing good, man. Uh, this is um, you know, we we didn't have any fights last weekend, and I feel like one week to me. When we don't have a fight, it feels like a whole month. Is that kind of the same thing with you? Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's been forever since we've done a show. It feels forever. And then today, we're dealing with a bunch of issues. We got a crazy snowstorm. We already have two feet of snow here. Then on top of that, my internet cuts out. So I'm using a hot spot right now. So I don't know what's going to go on with that. It's just It's been a hectic day. I'm ready for fights, and I'm ready for the snow to stop. And I'm at home recording. My daughter's making noise. I got my dog not listening. So if you hear background noise, I'm sorry. It's just been a it's been a crazy day. Yeah, if you're uh, if you're not from New England right now or in that area, we're getting smoked right now. Zach's in Pennsylvania. They just got two feet of snow. It's like working its way up all the way to Boston right now. We're getting like the wind picked up. It's like a light dusting, but we're supposed to get like two feet overnight. So. We're going to have a nice snow day, which is always fun to do. And then we'll, you know, we got the fights coming up this weekend, so I can't really complain too, too much. Yeah, we have two feet already, and it's it's going till tomorrow morning. We're supposed to get three, about three feet. It's That's crazy. Awful. That should be yeah, it's terrible. illegal. Yeah, I, I hate this weather. But anyway, man, we got fights. This is the third. We actually have three straight cards coming up of heavyweight headliners. Do we? Is that? Yeah, there's this, there, yeah, there's this right. one. There's right. Rosenstrike and uh, Gone. And then what's the other one? Is it? It's not Francis Stipe, is it? That's in March. That's like March 17th. I'm actually not sure. Oh, it's Lewis, Lewis Blades. Oh, Lewis Blades. That's right. That's right. A lot so of heavyweights going heavyweight in. Headliners. Yeah. And we also have Tom Aspinall's fighting soon. So uh, just a lot of heavyweight action coming up. And this card this weekend is stacked. Yeah, people are, I feel like, sleeping on this card coming up. Like, the, the main event is going to be awesome, but, like, every card on the main card is actually incredible. So I'm really looking forward to this one. And, and I like how they 
when there's a lot of like heavyweight action going on, like in a small amount of time, kind of similar how we just saw like a lot of the lightweights just fight. Like I like when they kind of pack all that into like a few weeks because that really drums it all up to the, you know, who's going to get the title contention and who's going to be the next contender. So I like when they do that. Yeah, and it gives us more to talk about. Like we're not switching around divisions. We're talking about, you know, the heavyweight division is going to be what's talked about for the next three weeks. And, you know, it's kind of hard to forget what happens in a three-week span. So uh, super, super excited for that. But do you have any new – before we get to the card and the new or the making our picks, anything – there? There to me, there's been a bunch of news. You got the Jake Paul, Ben Askren's official. Um, you know, that, that's a, that could be almost a whole show in itself. I feel like, you know, when you have you have the MMA world versus the boxing world and then Ben Askren's the man fighting for the MMA world, it's like it's almost like the NBA, like Nate Robinson represented the NBA. And it's like there's probably way better options in the NBA to fight Jake Paul than Nate Robinson. And same thing with UFC. There's way better MMA fighters out there that could, you know, fight Jake Paul. But the thing is, Jake Paul doesn't want to fight these guys. Yoel Romero offered to fight him. Uh, Michael Bisbing offered to fight him. There's been like three or four guys that have offered to fight Jake Paul, and he's turned them all down. So he only wants to fight certain guys. And then what kills me is boxers talk all this garbage, yet we don't see them cross over to UFC or MMA at all. They will only fight in boxing. So how tough really are these guys? I think that it's hilarious how much crap they talk because they're obviously – they talk all that crap because they can box. They wouldn't last three minutes in the octagon. So I think it's absolutely hilarious that they they, they run their mouths and then they can't, they can't back it up. And then you got Dylan Dennis on top of that who has two career fights in his entire career, but yeah, he thinks that he could beat anybody. Yeah, that it's a that's a whole loaded question there. Like that definitely could be like a whole episode on that one. But obviously, like I think the big reason they go into boxing is the money. You know, in, in the UFC fights, like only Conor McGregor really gets a nice big payday. And even when you compare that to what boxing is, like these guys are going to get paid like you know twenty plus million just to put on a crappy show, and they can just sell a whole more bunch of pay per views basically. So I'm not really excited about the fight. Like I made a video on it, like. If you're into MMA, if you know the UFC, like Bellator, all these promotions, you know who Ben Askren is. Like the dude was like an Olympic wrestler, basically, uh, NCAA two time national champion in wrestling. Like every single fight, like literally go watch his fights. You can pick any one of them and it's going to look exactly the same. Like he goes for that takedown, holds you down, gets ground and pound. Like that's how he wins fights. And when we saw him, like, try to strike against someone like Demi Amaya. Like he's so sloppy and like doesn't have power. No, like one shot knockouts. Um, his cardio might be good. Like that might be where his advantage would be. But Jake Paul has been training boxing for a few years now. So he's not, he's really no slouch at this point. And Ben Askren's been, you know, retired. If he's doing anything, it's probably in the wrestling world. So I'm not really expecting Ben Askren to put on a show by any means and kind of knock out, jake paul so i don't know where this is gonna go i'll, I'll probably watch it just because um but like i said if you know ben Askren, you're not gonna be super excited and if jake paul gets this win he's gonna be like oh i beat an mma guy blah 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 but that's that's nothing there's nothing to that and what did i say once conor mcgregor lost the floodgates opened and before you knew it yep. it didn't even take i don't even think it took an hour of conor mcgregor losing for jake paul to be back in the news so Soup, I'm just so over. Like, I want, I wish Yoel Romero would have fought him. Like, but you know, he's too scared. He would not, he wouldn't take oh. that fight because he knows, like, Yoel no. Romero would kill me. Oh, 100%. No one, no one wants to box Yoel Romero. Let's be honest. That's a, that's a lose lose for pretty much everyone. Yeah. And but the thing is, he's not even a boxer. Like, he's typically a wrestler. Yeah. Yoel Romero came to the UFC with a wrestling background. But he's just a scary individual. But that's the thing. Like, the, the thing that kills me is Jake Paul, you know, thinks that he's like this badass. He's not. Like, if you were really a no. badass and you were really a good fighter, you would do one fight in, in MMA, one fight in boxing. The thing is, no guys will do that. Floyd Mayweather never did it. Manny Pacquiao will never do it. We did see Ryan Garcia say that he he's, wants to retire by like 25 or something like that and then transition to MMA. I think that's cool. And by then, he's probably made enough money that he doesn't have to box anymore. So 
Um, that's cool. Like I like, I'd rather see more boxers do that. Hundred percent, hundred percent. You're gonna talk all that trash. Come into the octagon, they'll get smoked out. But th that's part of the whole thing. Like they know that because MMA, you can focus. Like I think Ben Askren actually said it. It's like you can focus on one thing in boxing, and it's just striking. But when you go into MMA, you have to worry about wrestling. You have to worry about grappling. You have to worry about head kicks. All these things. Like you can't just come into MMA, train for like a few months, and try to fight. Like that's not gonna happen. So I get why they're going with boxing, but. Yeah, they're just going to talk a ton of trash no matter what. And he's Jake Paul's no badass. Like he'll get this win and talk a whole bunch of crap. But until he fights someone legit, no, counting him out. Did you see that he's training with George Masvidal? Thought that was kind of funny. Thought that was kind of hilarious. Yeah, I did think that was funny. And the the last thing is the best. The the thing that one people will forget is Ben Askren is probably has sparred and trained with um, some decent boxers. So I, I'll say that he probably has a better a chance than Nate Robinson, but I still don't give him a, a pretty fair chance. No, and I, I had a few other headlines that we can go over too, but I also, if you wanted to do rate that matchup real quick, I had like four matchups that came out that were pretty huge um, that I'm very pumped about. So we can do that real quick. Um, but your boy, Brian Boom Keller, he's finally booked to, to fight Ricky Simone. That's going to be, and that's like, in two weeks that's on february 13th that's ufc 258 so to me that's a, not like a massive fight but like for the fans that's going to be an awesome fight so i know you're probably super excited about this one where do you have that one like one to five that's a four for me i that matchup i was excited for the first time it was booked obviously got banged because of covid and then after that simone so kelleher wanted to fight simone simone wanted to stay active so he ended up um, he ended up going and taking another fight. So I really really like that fight a lot. I think that it's about a four for me. Simone Kelleher, both guys super well rounded, very very good. Um, I think it has a chance to be a a, ver a very good fight. And Simone yeah, is a too. horse, dude. He's he is a house. Mm -hmm. He's freaking huge. He's and it seems like every time he fights, he gets better. Both guys always put in great performances. I think that has fight of the night potential too, like based on how those guys both fight. I think it could be a really, really good one. Oh, yeah. And we just saw Ricky Simone fight, and that, that was a short notice, whoever his opponent was, and he just went out there and put on an absolute clinic. I think he ended up getting the round two submission or finish, but that's an awesome fight. Like Those are going to be two great competitors, high-level guys. Um the rankings aren't really there, so it doesn't have like a ton of implications. But like I said, as like a fight fan, that's going to be an absolute banger. Definitely could be fight of the night potential there. Um, and I like how really we just said Ricky Simone just fought. He's turning around. Like that's a very quick fight for him. And Brian Kelleher, I know he I think he got COVID, but he was um he was very active in 2020. So I'm hoping that he kind of brings that into 2021 as well. Um, so I'll put that as a four too, just from like a fight fan perspective. That's going to be an awesome fight. But the next fight after that is a big fight. This is one that was kind of called out a little bit earlier, and they actually brought it into fruition here. So Darren Till is going to fight Marvin Vittori in April. That's on April 10th. Um, these are like two top five guys, so this is going to be huge. Um, what do you think about that one? That's going to be another four for me. Honestly, that could probably be creeping up to a four and a half. Major implications. Love. I love what both guys have done. Marvin Vittori has really turned it on like he's really starting to become like a really i'm not even gonna say prospect anymore like he's been in the ufc for a while but you know we didn't know how good he was like because we didn't know how good izzy was like and then you see how they fought the first time and now it's like marvin vittori is really starting to step it up now he's very well rounded he's got good striking he's got good wrestling the fight against hermanson was very good when he thought he was out of it he turned it right back around and ended up you know performing better in the later rounds which was huge. Um, and I think that it's a, it's a good fight. I think it's a good matchup for him. You know, I love Darren Till. Um, and D Darren Till, the thing is, you don't ever know what, what version of Darren Till you're going to get. Um, you know, his fight, I, if we get the version that he fought Robert Whitaker, I think that he has a better shot. I think it's a risky matchup for Darren Till. I think the Vittori's hot. His, he's very well rounded. Darren Till, I think, has the striking advantage. Um, but but Tori is just so strong, man. He's so strong. His wrestling is very good. Um, I think I give it more of the four and a half because 
I don't really know how it's going to go. Like when you have those fights that it could really go either way, like you could almost see if it stays on the feet till kind of picking them apart at distance, like the counter punching. But then at the same time, like you look at what Vittori did against Izzy, Izzy's a better striker than Till. They're kind of the similar styles, but Izzy's a better version. Then you're like, okay, well, maybe I can kind of lean towards Vittori in this one. So I think it's a huge step for Vittori and a risky fight for Till. Yeah, this is, I love, yeah, stylistically, like this is an awesome one because Marvin Vittori's like, you know, he's very wrestling heavy. Um, but he also has a ton of power. We obviously saw his cardio was actually pretty good in that five round fight against Hermanson. And then Darren Till coming coming up a weight class, you know, he fought really well against Robert Whitaker. I feel like he really turned a lot of heads in that one. And I don't know, man. I, I don't know who to choose in this one. I don't think obviously the odds have probably come out yet, but this has got to be really close. Like Darren Till being like that counter striker, will he be able to keep Vittori away? Vittori's gonna kind of bull rush him and try to get inside and get the takedowns. Like I, these are always super, super tough to see. Um, uh, but man, that's like four and a half for me. That's going to be an awesome fight. Two top five guys, both of which are, are very close to contention here. We know, actually, we're going to talk about the next fight too, which is in that same division. It's, it's Robert Whitaker facing, um, Paulo Costa, which is an awesome fight too. So we're going to have a um, pretty crowded division here depending on what Izzy does too. Like that has a lot of implications. Um, I'm pretty sure whoever wins Whitaker Costa is probably getting the title shot. But if Izzy doesn't come back, like then that means Till and Vittori have a lot more on the line here. So definitely a really big fight. Really looking forward to that one. But that kind of dovetails into the next one. That's Whitaker versus Costa. Obviously a super massive fight in this division. What do you think about that one? I'm going to go five. I'm going to go five. Very, it's... Often I wouldn't give fives, you know, as a teacher, I feel like, you know, you really got to, it's got to really jump off the card. And one, everyone's a fan of Robert Whitaker. Like whenever he fights, he is a, he is a draw. He's awesome to watch. So I'm super excited to see him back. And I love the matchup because I, I think Paulo Costa is going to come out um, and, and he's going to, he's going to be a different fighter. I, I like, he's going to have the same game plan, I think, but you know, you get humbled when you lose and it, one of two things can happen. You're either going to shit the bed again because, you know, like some guys never rebound from a loss. Costa still pretty young. So, and I think again, it's, it's Whitaker is not the tallest guy in that division. Costa is this hulking looking human being. Um, so it just, it just, and like you said, the implications is, you know, you got to factor that into when you're giving a grade. I mean, if Izzy was to vacate the title now, that's the title shot. That, that's that's for the belt. So to me, anytime it's a title title shot, you almost have to give it a five. And then you add Whitaker to it. You add Costa, who I'm not a huge fan of Paulo Costa, but you do have to admire like the knockouts that he's had and, and the, some of the fights that he's have had has been great. I still lean towards Whitaker. I think he's I, his power is great. He's more well-rounded. Um you know, and again, we saw him use his wrestling against Darren Till or yeah, against Darren Till in which he didn't do before. So I think that he does that. We have a little bit uh, different version of Robert Whitaker as well to kind of get out of harm's way from some of those punches, punches from Costa. Man, I, I tell you, I think Robert Whitaker might be one of the most underrated, like flying under the radar fighters, just being an ex champ. And then he went out there on his comeback after like two years, had a really, really tough loss against Izzy gets knocked out in front of like a hundred thousand fans and that was like new zealand versus australia that was like a huge event i remember that one that was probably one of the biggest events that i can remember in recent history and then to come back from that loss and defeat darren till and jared cannoneer like that just really speaks to how good he is and was at one point and i really do b believe it's like it's izzy one whitaker one a costa got exposed like real in a really bad fashion against adesanya so i i don't i'm not really in on paulo costa right now like he's still i know he, he kind of went to war with um yoel romero which is a good win but i still need to see more from him to kind of jump on his bandwagon um so i'm definitely leaning towards whitaker in this one just he's looked so good all the way around in every aspect of mma so um it's definitely a five the, the star power is incredible here and you can't just sleep on costa's one shot knockout power he will always hold that. But just the fact that Whitaker was able to keep Cannoneer away for a while just kind of leads me to believe he'll be able to do that with Costa. So this is an awesome fight. And both of these, so the Vittori-Till fight, 
Costa Whitaker. Those are happening within a week of each other in April. Izzy fights what in March. So we'll see, you know, if he loses, I don't know what he's going to do. If he wins, he might try to stick around at light heavyweight, which would mean the title implications might be there for this fight in April. So definitely a lot going on here. Really excited for that one, but that's a, that's an easy five for me. Um, good, good you know, call on the underrated too, because he is yeah. like probably, I would say he's honestly probably one of the most underrated fighters in UFC history. Like what he's mm -hmm. done at his age is ridiculous. Like he's still 30. <laughs> I mean, he's, like, yeah, he's, like, like, he's like the Holloway thing where like they've been around forever and they they're both ex champions, but they're both like right around 30 years. Like they're still potentially like hitting their prime right now, which is absolutely mind blowing. So yeah, that's, I think that's pretty cool. I kind of, it's a bummer that I didn't really watch UFC earlier because Whitaker obviously was an animal. And then when I started watching it, he was on his like two year hiatus because of the injury. So I didn't really get to see too much of him. And now that he's fought more, I'm like, this dude's a savage. Um, but the last one on here, and it's, we've probably already talked about this one. I know we've already talked about this one. You can have your fun on it, but it's Uriah Hall and Chris Weidman. They, I forget which one of them got COVID. I think it was Weidman got COVID. So they had to scrap this one, reschedule it for April 24th. And I know we're not really, um, too much of a pro Chris Weidman podcast here, but I got Uriah Hall taking this one all day. It's not a great matchup. I'd give it like a two and a half. To, I think it's going to go round one knockout. That is probably going to be Chris Weidman's last fight, I would yeah. think. And I go, I agree. I'd say that's probably like a two for me. Yeah, we don't even need to give it. I know we've already talked about that fight because it was announced at one point. It just got scrapped and rebooked. So those are the four matchups that I had. Uh, obviously, the first three of those are awesome. But the last one, not so great. But we definitely have like, we're pretty much filled out up until March, I feel like at this point. So there's going to be a lot of good fights coming up, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm amped. Lots of good stuff coming up. Um, and this weekend's card is is electric. Like, really, from beginning to end is is going to be really, really good. Even the prelims. Our man Slow Mike is back this yeah. weekend. So we're super excited for that. I think the prelims are almost just as good as the main card. And we have a six-fight main card. I don't know if we're getting into that now or if you had other news. But... Um yeah, I have a, just like a few other news that kind of came up. I know I don't know if you saw James Vick, and he recently fought in XMMA, which is obviously like a smaller promotion, but he got knocked. He got pieced up real bad, and the the ref had to step in and stop that one. Man, he has really fallen off a cliff, and I never want to like bad talk someone's career really that much, but man, he he did not look good, and that's got to be probably the end for him. Yeah, his career is a hundred percent over. Like you cannot like. X MMA signed James Vick to go out there and knock this guy out. Probably like to be yeah. almost like the face of the promotion. Like we have an ex UFC guy here and he got uh, like, I heard, so I didn't get to watch it, but I heard actually round one, he looked okay to start. And then like the guy just hit him with a couple shots. He didn't actually go out. He would just, he yeah. wore so many punches. The ref ended up stopping it, but he looked awful. He, he, I don't know what happened, man. Like once the chin's gone, it's gone and he's only 32. Like that's what's crazy. Yeah. Like he lost it so early, but uh, yeah, James Vick is, he's done, man. There's no way you recover from that. I don't know like how XMMA works. I don't know if he signed like a three, four fight contract or whatever it was. He's probably the highest paid guy and now they're shit in their pants because he sucks. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, yeah, so UFC got it right cutting him, or I don't know, maybe his contract ran out. But uh, yeah, no more James Vick. And you know what's crazy is if you look at his last six fights, all losses, and I think four or five out of the six, all knockouts. I mean, that's oh, yeah. when it's time to to hang it up. And the only person I think that didn't knock him out was Paul Felder. Come on, Paul, you're my guy. You need Slacking. to be knocking out guys like James James Vick. Yeah, he's been on the wrong side of a few like bad like the Nico Price one. I think was like the up kick that knocked him out. Like everyone's gonna remember that. Like that's like a bad way to be remembered. You don't want to be the guy that gets up kicked. Like his the one the one Jesus. against Gaethje was really bad too. Yeah, yeah he he's on his way out. Unfortunately, he it is what it is. You know it, it happens. I get it. Not everyone's UFC caliber, but I mean XMMA. I've never heard of it. So to go out there and lose that one, that's got to be really tough for his uh, you know his self-esteem and his confidence going in there um well the thing is he has kids he has kids too like 
there's got to be a certain time you got to hang it up, man. Like you're getting your brain just absolutely like yeah. your brain is starting to detach like from your your skull. Like you just need to stop because you have kids like that's way more important at this point than than going yeah. out there and getting your face bashed in every single time. The the clip is out there of him and like getting he didn't get knocked out but like it's like a 50 second clip of him basically just eating like a whole bunch of uppercuts and you can hear like the commentators like if he gets hit like two or three more times like the ref has to step in of course that actually happened and he just he looked real lost in that fight from what I saw in the 50 second clip so you'll have to check it out if you can find it but if uh, if Herb Dean was refing we would have yeah. had a James Vick obituary the next morning oh yeah. <laughs> That would have went on for another five minutes. He would just be walking around, just woozy, not a good look. But the so the lightweight division, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if you've seen Dustin Poirier in the news. Like, yes, Dana White wanted Chandler Poirier, but Poirier is like taking a step back and saying, like, I, I don't want to fight Chandler. Like, that's not the guy that I want to fight. He even seems like he doesn't want to fight Charles Oliveira. He would be okay if, if Oliveira and Chandler fought for the belt and he just stepped away and, and, and watched it. Like I don't really understand like what he's looking for. Like, does that mean he he wants the Connor fight? Like, does he want Khabib? Like he obviously only wants like two or three specific guys. And if it's not Oliveira or Chandler, I mean, those are kind of the two front runners right now. It's odd because after the fight, he mentioned that Oliveira was like the one guy he would fight for the belt because he feels like Oliveira is deserving. Um, I don't know, man. Dustin Poirier is a kind of like a weird dude, because it was after after one of his – it was, I think, the fight before the Connor fight. Like he said, like he's a guy that really likes to take a lot of time. He doesn't like to – he doesn't really like to fight often anymore. Um, he even has said that he doesn't like to fight anymore. Um, I don't know, man. I don't think we're going to see a lot more Dustin Poirier. Like I definitely think that he's going to fight for the belt – or he's going to be the champ, but like he just kind of seems to be like done. Like he seems like he's in a good place. Um, I think that he would absolutely handle Michael Chandler. I think Oliveira is a little bit of a tough matchup, but I still think that, that if he kept the fight standing and Poirier is pretty good at keeping the fights on the feet, as long as he did that, I think that he would end up winning. I really don't see anyone in that division really matching up well with him. So I, I, I don't think it's a scared thing. I think, it's it's more so the passion. Maybe he needs more time away to really get hungry for fights. Um, so I don't know. Like I, that's how Poirier is. Like he look at his time between fights. Like he fights like once a year. So he could have fought now and and all right next year I'll come back and fight the winner of Oliveira Chandler. Like it's it, it is what it is. Maybe he's just supremely confident that he could be either one of them. Let them fight for the belt and I'll come take it. Like. I don't know. Like, I'm not going to look too much into it because he's already proven enough to me. Like, he can't beat Khabib. No one in the division could beat Khabib, but I honestly think that he could handle everyone else in that division. Um, I love Dustin Poirier. And, like, you know, after letting the whole knockout, him knocking out Connor, like, sink in, like, what a monumental moment. Huge for that guy. Couldn't have happened to a better guy. And, uh, like I said, I mean, he's been in the fight game for a long ass time, too. Like his record is insane. He's been doing it forever. He's got a daughter now. Like he says all the time, I can't wait to get back home. Like after the fight, whether we win or lose, it's always, I can't wait to go back home. That's just kind of where he's at right now. So, you know, maybe he's just like, okay, let them fight for the belt and I'll come back when I'm ready. Like he's already solidified his chance to fight for the belt unless Khabib was to come back. Yeah. And I also think part of him probably feels like a little bit disrespected just because, you know, Michael Chandler. I mean, he hasn't really earned it. Like that's just one and oh in the UFC against Dan Hooker, a guy that he had already beaten. So I kind of get where he's coming from a little bit. Like I think he might feel disrespected. Where if Khabib vacates this, he pretty much thinks that he should just be crowned the lightweight champ because he's beaten Justin Gaethje. I I agree. Yeah. I think he should. Yeah, without a doubt. Like he literally he just knocked out Connor in fashion that no one's ever done before. He beat Justin Gaethje. He beat Dan Hooker. Like, just crown him the champ. I think he's feeling a little bit disrespected that Dana White's really not talking about that, and he's more just like, okay, Michael Chandler's going to get the next shot, or Charles Oliveira's in line, Justin Gaethje's in line. So I, I kind of get where he's coming from. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting. But also, Patricio came out. I don't know if you saw this, but he said 
he thinks Michael Chandler would beat Poirier easily. And then if Michael Chandler, if that was for the belt, it would be Michael Chandler and Patricio over in Bellator. And he was like, well, then we have to fight at that point, promotion versus promotion to see like who is the best lightweight, even though we already know Patricio beat Chandler. That's funny because Patricio only wants to fight a UFC champ if it's Michael Chandler because he's already yep. beat him. So, yeah. But Dustin, but if Dustin Poirier is the champ, like I don't want to fight him because right. That that's like these guys kill me, man. That's the same thing. It's almost the same mindset. It's so gimmicky. That was saying with boxing, yeah. Like, yeah. Okay, I'll fight Michael Chandler because I've already beat him. I won't fight anyone else. Like, no, Dustin Poirier is the best lightweight outside of Khabib. Like, he is he. Dude's good, man. His boxing is so good. I think that honestly, I I kind of agree. Like, I don't think Michael Chandler should get the next shot. I was super impressed by his win. You know, I'm I'm on the Michael Chandler train. I think he belongs where he's at in that division. I think if anything, if Dustin doesn't want to fight, go Charles Oliveira, Justin Gaethje for the belt at that point. Like Justin Gaethje's already proven it. His you know he was on a run aside from Khabib. So go those two. Um, and let, let, uh, Chandler fight someone else. And then if he, if he, you know, destroys them, okay, now he's number one contender or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't think that he should get it. I don't think he should get it based on one win. We also didn't see the best version of Dan hooker and that's not taking anything away from Michael Chandler at all. Like he had a great game plan. It worked. He, he was, he looked great, but I still think that, you know, had Dan hooker come out and been himself, I'm not gonna say Michael Chandler doesn't win, but I think it's a little bit different of an outcome as far as the fight. I don't think would end that fast, you know. So yeah. sometimes it's not a good thing when the fight ends so quick, especially with a guy making his debut in the UFC, because it's like, okay, it was great, but there's still so many unanswered questions. Yeah, no, yeah, you're right. Because we said we say the same thing about a guy like Chimaev. We're like, okay, he's been in the octagon for like a minute total. And yet we're already throwing him into the – he's fighting Leon Edwards, who's ranked number three. Like it's it's insane, but there's so many questions that are not answered, and it's the same thing about Michael Chandler. Yeah, he caught he caught Dan Hooker big time, knocked him right out, but that's not going to happen against someone like Dustin Poirier. Like he's going to be game, and he can switch it up and, and go to the ground with you if you want to, or his striking is a little bit better. So, yeah, it, it's interesting, but all, apparently all these guys are just savvy businessmen. I don't know. They're just calling their shots. They want the big money fight. Obviously, Patricio versus Chandler, promotion versus promotion. Like that would be a mega fight. I don't, you know, I, I, if he wants to make that call, that's fine. Like I, I, I understand where he's coming from, but it is a good point to be like, okay, well, what about Dustin Poirier? What about when Khabib was here? You didn't want to test it then. So it's the same thing with like Jake Paul not wanting to fight anyone else outside of Ben Askren. So it's all gimmicky. It's that's just where we're at with W. Or I almost said WWE. <laughs> Because that's that's like where yeah, we're at, which is UFC. perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're not that's, wrong. I yeah. totally agree. That's like where it's going down, I and mean, we've like kind of found this like as the new trend, where like these fighters will just bounce up in between divisions and get title shots out of nowhere. I still can't believe like Cody Garbrandt at some point is going to get the shot at 125, even though his next fight's at 135 against Aldo. Like all these things that are happening in the UFC are just blowing my mind. Any other any other news? No, I I only had a few. I mean, just one other quick thing. Anthony Rocco Martin he parted ways with the UFC. I mean, that's not huge really? news. I didn't know it's that. a little disappointing. Yeah, I guess um, his contract was up, and they just decided to part ways. I think it was a mutual thing. I don't think it was one or the other. Um, but he was obviously Damn, just like was, a solid fighter. I was a big fan of Anthony Rocco Martin. I yeah. actually thoroughly enjoyed all his fights. I thought he, you know, he's a very. I think he's very good. You know, I. I is he like title contention guy? No, but like I really enjoyed his fights and I thought that he he's like one of those guys like you feed him to anyone like he's going to put up a good fight. It's never going to yeah. be a you're not just going to run through him. So damn, that's crazy. So, you know, I could see him going to a decent promotion though after that. Yeah. And, and that's a guy that, you know, he's not really, really old, so he could always make it make a comeback too. Yeah, and I feel like that's sometimes what goes through their mindset at that point. They're like, okay, uh, he so he's ranked like 22. He's a little bit outside the 15, and maybe he knows that he's not going to ever win a belt in the UFC. So maybe he's like, okay, you know what? Maybe I go to another promotion where I have more opportunity. I could be like a top 10, top 5 guy, 
and just it's not happening in the UFC. So I get where he's coming from too, if that's his mindset. But yeah, I'll miss him. He was a, he was a solid fighter. His last fight I think was against Neil Magny, and that was on you know Neil Magny's huge run, and he actually put up a good fight against Magny, and that's that's a really tough competitor. So yeah, well, well I think Anthony that he's Rocco recovering Martin. from an injury. He's recovering from an injury too. I think like he he suffered like a pretty severe injury, so mm. maybe that played played a factor into some of some of it as well okay yeah well that's the the last thing that i had if you want to go into picks now we can do that so you're gonna have to run us through the fights because i can't look up anything if i mess with my phone the hot spot goes off and it gets all messed up so uh i can't really i can't really look at the betting line statistics i can't really look at anything uh, because okay. if I do that, then my, my phone and we'll get disconnected here. So, um, if you can run us through the fights and then I'll make the picks. Also, Carrie's yeah. not with us today, obviously due to the snow, he's out plowing. He has a bunch of houses and stuff that he has to plow for his tenants. So, um, I might do a live video later in the week with him and he he'll just be live with me and he'll be making his picks. You get a whole whole five to ten minutes of a witty witty carry pick so make sure you don't miss that most likely on thursday there you go well kind of luckily this first fight that we have on the the main card is diego federa versus benil daryush which we already covered in our short video last week which i'm still kind of waiting to see if that's getting posted by dave shout out dave what's he doing with that <laughs> all good um so number nine yeah, diego so we, well, we all picked daryush right I'm pretty sure. I know I did because that's my guy, so I have to ride with Daryush, but I think we were both on that train. I know. I I, I picked – I was originally leaning to – And Zach was kicked out. Let's see if he jumps back in here. Sorry, I got disconnected. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was originally leaning towards Diego Ferreira in this one, and then you know they had already fought, and Darius is just on a run, man. Every time he faces a tough opponent, he goes crazy. So I'm going. I, I was going Benil Darius. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's okay. If you want to do that pick now, and, and how do you want to have him winning by? I, I had TKO. I really like the striking, putting the punches in bunches. I don't know. He's he's looked he's looked good, man. I'm I'm with you. I'm kind of you. Kind of got me on this Benil Dariush hype train, dude. Let's go. The, the guy is just phenomenal. Like you look at his last five fights; they're all wins, two submissions, two TKO slash KOs, one unanimous decision. Like he's on an absolute run. Pretty difficult opponents. Like he he finished Scott Holtzman, the first to ever do that. The Drakkar close fight was really tough. Frank Camacho, Drew Dober, Tiago Moises. Like those are solid names and now he's finally in the top 10 now oh no he's sorry he's number 12 uh diego ferreira is number nine he's in the top 10 but he's a super difficult opponent very very advanced level in uh brazilian jiu-jitsu he's a third degree black belt the guy is a problem he's very aggressive he's always pushing forward his striking is actually pretty solid he has a lot of power um kind of unorthodox with his striking but he can definitely hurt you and if he gets close enough, he can obviously take you down. And his ground and pound is very solid. And obviously his submission game is, you know, A plus. So that's it's a tough fight. Don't get me wrong. But I just like that Darius will probably be a little bit more of like a versatile striker. And if it does go to the ground, like he's still a black belt as well. Like he has fought in a whole bunch of different tournaments with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He trains in Muay Thai. Um, he's just very very well rounded. So I like Daryush and I'm also taking him by TKO. So that's both of and, us. And he's got he's got gray hair, dude. He yeah. fights with gray dad hair. Too. Like dad bod, yeah. gray so, hair and he just knocks you out. Yeah, so I mean I I feel like I got to ride with him just cuz of that. Yep, I agree. This uh the next fight is uh another one of our guys. So Andre Ewell or Ewell who we had on the show um, a couple months back now, but he's an absolute character. He was one of the more fun interviews that we've had, and uh, he's taken on Cody Stamen. That's that's a really tough fight. This is, I think, short notice for Andre. Um, kind of the the big difference here, if I read this correctly, Andre Ewell has the or Ewell has this eleven inch reach advantage. 
he has a 75 inch reach. He's only five foot eight. Like that's an insane reach to have over someone. Uh, Cody Stamen is more like he's pretty wrestling heavy too, but he's also a pretty good striker. So I'm, I'm curious to see what he does. He has 11 takedown in, in his last five fights. He had three against Aljamain Sterling. He's faced a lot of tough competition. Um, one kind of like betting nugget here, seven out of the eight UFC fights Cody Stamen's been in have went to decision. And if you look at Andre as well, like he goes to decision a lot. So this one's definitely trending in the, if you can get the over two and a half rounds, like that's definitely the move. So this one's really difficult to choose. Uh, Andre Ewell, he doesn't really have like a ton of power. He's more of a striker, but like he has so much of that reach advantage that I'm kind of, I'm leaning towards him in this one. I think if he's able to keep that distance, like that's just too significant to, to maybe overcome for some fighters. So I, I like to, I will ride with our guy, Andre Ewell by decision. Yeah, I feel like he's been on our show, and I'm sure he'll be on again. I feel like we can't pick against those guys. Yeah. So I'm go I got to go with Andre Yule. And the only thing that does worry me is Stamon is a very good wrestler. And, you know, I haven't seen Andre really stuff many takedowns. Um, so he has to keep this fight at a distance. He doesn't have great power. But, man, his videos of him boxing on Instagram, like his hands are ridiculous. Like he does have – some crazy fast hands. Um, you know what? I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going oh Andre Yule. I'm going to go knockout. I'm going to go Let's knockout. Go. He's got he's got hands. He says his hands are better than Odell. I like the confidence that he has. Um, and he's due. Like, he's due for a finish. On the regional circuits, he was knocking guys out. It hasn't translated. I think that he's got to finally put himself on the map with a, with a finish here. Yeah, it's like he has seven knockouts on his record out of 17 wins. Like that's still pretty good. It's just like I think in the UFC, we haven't really seen that too, too much. But he's faced really good. Like he lost to Marlon Vera, lost to Nathaniel Wood, like has wins over Jonathan Martinez, who's like a solid up and comer, uh, Henan Barrow. So he's he's faced good competition himself. So it, this is going to be a good fight. I think this is actually going to be a really fun one to watch stylistically. I, I do like this one a lot. So we both have our guy, Andre Yule. You got TKO. I got decision. And that will take us to our next fight, which is honestly, all these fights are awesome. This next one's in the flyweight division. Pantoja, Alexander Pantoja. He's number five ranked in that division right now. It takes on Manal Cape? Cop? Not sure. But it's his, it's Manal Cop's UFC debut in this one. Um, he's 15 and four pro record. He's pretty much finished all of his fights, except one of them, uh, nine by TKO or knockout five of those by submission. He fights out of, um, Ryzen. He was a Ryzen champ back in the day. And now he's transitioning into the UFC. He's a young guy, only 27 years old, pretty good experience so far. He's a very athletic fighter from what I've read, but Alexander Pantoja, man, that's a super tough fight. This guy's 22 and five, six and three in the UFC. He's fought Davison Figueredo, Brandon Moreno, uh, Matt Schnell, Askarov. Like he's faced all the the elite competition in this division, and you know he was in the Ultimate Fighter. He didn't win the Ultimate Fighter. I think he lost in the semifinals. Um, he fights out of American Top Team. Like this dude is absolutely elite. So I, I like Manel coming in here as, the, as his UFC debut. It's just a really tough matchup to take on the number five ranked Pantoja. So. I, I think uh, you got to lean towards Pantoja in this one, and I will go with TKO, Pantoja. How so? I, I I've watched Pantoja fight. I, I like Pantoja. What is so on his record? Like, what's the knockouts to submissions to decision wins? Like, what's... the dude's like straight across the board. He has eight TKOs or knockouts, eight submissions, and that would leave him with like seven decisions so the dude is just well-rounded all the way through and you went tko i'm gonna go submission pantoja I'm, go I'm going pantoja winning regardless i really like him i think he's a stud um but to try to separate us here and try to get us some you know one either falling back or one moving forward uh i'm gonna go opposite of you there well you know we're i know we're kind of in competition but we're actually chasing carry you know, he's the one that I know. we need to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and he's making his picks afterwards. So that kind of puts us at a, a little bit of a disadvantage. We'll see if he's kind of listening to this and then makes his picks based on that. Maybe we should hide our picks so he has no idea. Yeah, I was thinking that too. Maybe we'll see what the what the numbers are um, when Kerry isn't listening to us. I was thinking. He said you know, a, yeah, go ahead. He said there's a method. There, he said there's a method that he's using. He hasn't he hasn't disclosed that method that method to me. But he said okay. there's a method that he's using. I'm thinking at some point, you know, scary Kerry might have to be removed if he's actually the better picker of, of the three of us. Like now he, we're in the disadvantage like he's smoking us yeah i know i don't know what the numbers are but i know he's up by a pretty good margin yeah i'll post it when i do the picks post i'll, I'll make sure to get the score updated but i know we're, we're behind by a little bit but um all right so fourth fight on this card this is a women's bantamweight fight you have number 10 marion renault taking on number 12 macy chiasson uh renault i i've i don't think i've seen her fight but dude, she's 43 years old. She's obviously been in the UFC for a while. Um, she has a nine, six and one pro record, only five, five and one in the UFC. So pretty close to 500 there, but she's definitely faced a lot of uh, solid competition. Sarah McMahon, who we just saw fight Juliana Pena. Um, she actually beat Jessica Andrade back in the day. But when you look more recently, she's actually on a three fight losing streak. All of those by unanimous decision to uh, Rocky Pennington, Kunitskaya and Kat Zingano. So tough losses for sure, but that is a three fight losing streak. You do add in the fact that she's 43 years old. Um, she's taken a ton of damage so far, like her last two fights. If she's absorbed like over a hundred strikes each. So really tough for her. Macy Chiasson. She's um, she actually won the ultimate fighter back in 2018. She's seven and one pro record three and one in the UFC. She actually has a lot of finishes, um, three TKO or knockouts, two by submission. Her first two wins in the UFC were both finishes, TKOs or knockouts. Um, she's just a really, really good striker, very high volume, but she also works in the takedowns. Um, she has a pretty good submission average as well. So this seems like a really tough fight for um, Marion Renault. Chiasson's also 5'11", will have a 4-inch reach advantage. She's only 29 years old. I, I really like her in this fight. Uh, usually, I would go with decision in this case, but I actually like Chiasson by TKO. All I had to hear was that Renault was 43, and I was not picking her. Yep. Um, I'm, go I'm going uh, Chia Chiasson, Ch Chia whatever it is. Um, I'm actually going to go decision, and I'm typically someone who, who will lean towards the female fighters going decision. You don't get too many uh, Marina Rodriguez knockouts in uh, in the women's fight, so I'm gonna go decision. But uh, it, it could happen though. She obviously has decisions on her record, and then you got the fact that Renault is 43. That's tough. That's pretty damn old. She might be the oldest in the UFC with that number, 43. I don't know if anyone's higher than that, but uh, you got to factor that in, especially if she's on a three fight losing streak. You're just like, all right, well maybe she just doesn't really have it anymore. So. Kind of seems silly not to take her in this one, but I don't know what the odds are in that one. I don't have the odds up, but the uh, second fight, or this is actually the co-main event, and we've already touched upon this one, so this is going to be Corey Sandhagen taking on Frankie Edgar. I already know we made our picks. I believe we both had Sandhagen in this one, um, but just to kind of break it down a little bit, Corey Sandhagen, unbelievable up-and-coming star. I, I personally believe he's like top three in this division. I think him and Aljo are actually the two best. Um, he's huge. He's 5'11", 70 inch reach for 135ers. That's that's massive. Uh, 13 and two pro record, six and one in the UFC. He just knocked out Marlon Marias in pretty wild fashion, which a lot of people do not do. Um, so I really like that one. The Aljo fight was a little tough. He got submitted the backpack submission in round one in like the first like 30 seconds. I don't think that's a good indicator of where he's at. I do hold Sanhagen in a very high regard. Frankie Edgar just came down to 135, um, put on a really good fight against a tough opponent in Pedro Munoz and kind of blew a, a lot of people away with that one. He was the big underdog going into it. Um, I didn't think the weight cut would really be good for him, but he is a smaller guy, obviously pretty wrestling heavy as well. So I think that's going to be his advantage. One thing I didn't mention in our video last time or last week Corey Sandhagen has 30% takedown defense. 
That's really bad, like, especially against someone like Frankie Edgar, who's obviously a very accomplished wrestler. I don't think Frankie has really used his wrestling in a little while, but like it'll definitely be there. It's just going to be really tough to do that against someone who's five inches taller and has a two inch reach advantage on you. So I still like Sanhagen in this one, and I forget how I took it, but I, I do like uh, a good decision. Yeah, I think I had Sanhagen at, for a decision as well. Edgar's a really tough guy to finish. Um, not saying that Sanhagen can't can't throw in a head kick or something like that and rock him, but Edgar's chin has just always seemed to hold up. He wore a lot of good shots against Munoz. Um, I just think at the end of the day, and yes, Sanhagen's takedown defense is bad, but Frankie's a real small guy. Like I feel like it might be a little bit easier to stuff him. Um, I, I don't see Sanhagen being able to get a submission. I feel like with the side, like sometimes when you're a lankier guy, there's an advantage, but I feel like when you're a lankier guy facing a dude that's super small, it's kind of hard to grab onto an arm or, or a leg with those, with that just being so much bigger than him. So I think it's going to be a little bit tougher. I think that if, if Sanhagen's going to get a finish, it's going to be by a knockout. Um, but Edgar, Edgar is just a tough dude. And because it's only a three round fight, I think it has a better shot to go to decision. I think that if it was five rounds, I think Sanhagen may be able to kind of piece up Frankie a little bit through rounds one through three and then kind of four and five, maybe start pouring it on. But I feel like since it's only three rounds, it has a better shot to go the distance. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I kind of always forget this. So this is a co-main. This is only three rounds, even though this probably could be a main event on another card at some point. And obviously like Frankie what? Edgar. Yep. I was going to say, what do you think? Like, what do you think they should do? So like, obviously like this fight is basically for number one contender. Like, I feel like those five fights rounds. could be made like five rounds because yep. we need to know what those guys are made of when they're going to fight for the belt. So, like, I mean, occasionally you'll see, you'll see the co-mains go five if it's for the belt. But, like, maybe, like, if it's if it's a fight for number one contender and you label it as that, which I don't, they don't really do that in the UFC typically. But, like, I feel like it wouldn't be a bad idea to make those five. Not every co-main, but, like, if it has major yeah. implications like this one, I feel like it should be five rounds. Yeah, I, I don't know. They'd have to like somehow come up with a way to say like if you're say with both fighters are within the top five, then that says, OK, we're going to do a five round fight because like you look at like Robert Whitaker versus Cannon Air, That was only three rounds. Um, we just saw obviously Michael Chandler, Dan Hooker. That was three rounds. I mean, it ended after a minute, but that's like another fight that easily could have been a five round fight. Like you said, these guys are in contention. They need the five round experience. I think it is kind of time for the UFC to, to acknowledge that. So the co-main should be given some five rounds as well. It's a good point. And with, with Cannoneer and Whitaker, like Cannoneer was pouring it on. Yep. Like at the end of round three. So they come out round four. You don't know, like, and, and, but it also changes the mindset of Whitaker too. So, you know, if it was five rounds, it could have that round maybe not doesn't go that way, but it's just things that you look at. Like I, I kind of, I like the, if you're in the top five, like, Okay, it's it's a five round go, but if you're five fighting six, then it's a little bit tough. I guess that would be three. Yeah, because I think even if this was five rounds, like that could favor Frankie Edgar in this one because he has a ton of five round experience. He has championship experience, like big fight experience. Uh, someone like that who could utilize the wrestling, even going into the later rounds, like that could definitely favor Frankie Edgar. So the fact that it's only three rounds, I think it makes it a lot easier for Corey Sandhagen. Um, especially given the size and the reach advantage, like we're saying. So it's an awesome fight, though. I think it's a really cool fight. Um, we'll see what happens. This obviously will probably lead to the next guy up for the title shot. I think actually I just saw a poll someone posted. They said if Frankie wins this, does that justify him getting the next title shot? I voted yes on it, but I think the majority actually said no. All right. So that takes us to our main event of the night. This is an awesome fight. Uh, we have Alistair Overeem, number five ranked heavyweight right now, taking on Alexander Volkov, who is number six in the rankings. I was actually surprised to see Volkov is the minus 180 favorite, or at least he was at the time that I looked this up. Uh, so that means you can get Overeem at plus 150, which I really, really like what Overeem's been doing in his last five fights. Like he's four and one in the last five. That one loss was to Rosenstrike which was in round five, a, a fight that he was clearly winning, and he got caught with four seconds left, left and cut his lip like wide open, which was wild. 
Um, but I just really like Alistair Overeem. It's another guy who's just like turned a corner. He's 40 years old, but for some reason, like he's one potentially one fight away from getting a title shot. And the dude, when I kind of looked at his his whole history and everything, he obviously has 60 plus pro fights. Like he's he's been fighting professionally since the 90s. Like how many people can you say that with right now? Like maybe one or two. But he 1999 was his pro debut, and dude, he's fought like generational elite level talent like through the 90s the 2000s the early 2000s like he's fought everyone never has held the ufc gold though that's like the one thing on his record he had the title shot against stipe did not get it done he got knocked out in round one um but he's so close to it and i really like him against volkov i get volkov's really difficult super lanky six seven they actually have the same reach they're both 80 inch reach advantage or sorry they both have an 80 inch reach so no advantage there um but volkov he's pretty young he's only 32 has a ton of experience he's 32 and 8 in his pro record six and two in the ufc but it just seems like every time he gets a tough fight he drops it and i think um something that we're going to see is, is probably Overeem utilizing his ground game which he's very good at the ground and pound will be there I don't think Volkov is going to be able to really handle himself at that point. So I really like Overeem in this one, especially at the plus 150 underdog. I, I'll go by TKO too, Overeem. I think that I think that with the if you're from a betting standpoint, you have to put the money on Overeem at plus, you know, what 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 did you say? 150? 150. But, but I'm gonna go with Volkov here. I think the one thing that we've seen with the and I love Overeem like, to see Overeem win one more. But um, one thing I think that Volkov's going to do is come out and push the pace on Overeem. And I think if he does that, Overeem's chin cannot handle a ton of shots. And I think if Volkov can land one or two clean ones, if he if he really pushes the pace on Overeem early in the fight, lands a couple big combinations early, the fight's going to be over. I th- I could almost I can honestly almost see Volkov knocking out Overeem in round one. Maybe a bold statement, um, but Volkov is a very crafty striker. He can his kicks are good. His obviously he's a very good boxer, and I just I think that he if he pushes the pace early, gets inside on Overeem quick, and lands a couple big shots. I think it's going to be done. That's kind of what happened with Rosenstrike. Like it was super close. Then all of a sudden they start getting in this battle, throwing punches, and then Overeem gets caught once and it's over. Um, so I, I like Volkov in this one. Um, I like Volkov in the division. Honestly, I think he's, he's pretty well-rounded. I don't think he wins the belt, but, um, I, I like him a lot. Like he pieced up Derek Lewis pretty good. He wore one shot and ended up losing that, that fight, but was winning the whole entire time prior to that. Um, and he's looked good. He really has looked good. It pains me cause I love Overeem. He's a legend. I don't want him to lose, but from a pick standpoint, Hopefully I can get a win over you and start leaning, getting towards carry. So uh, I'm going to go Volkov here and I'm actually going to go TKO. Yeah. Like I, I do like Volkov. Like I think he's super talented, especially like being in the heavyweight division. He's six, seven, but he moves well. And like, I, I looked into his background a little bit. Like he fights that karate style. He's a brown belt in karate. He's a black belt in Sushin Gen, which is apparently another style of karate, but he's also a brown belt. Brazilian jiu-jitsu like super well-rounded guy really really difficult opponent to fight Um, and I think yeah he fought Derek Lewis very well in that fight he just got caught similar to how Overeem got caught too so this should be a really fun matchup Um, I don't think it'll necessarily go like the Blades fight where Volkov just got taken down like time after time and then I think did he get finished or no he went all five didn't he I don't remember Blades I think I he remember. went all five, but I don't see it going that way where Overeem's like overpowering the whole time. Um, but I think I think Overeem will catch him. I think he'll get the the finish. righty. that's gonna do it, right? That's it. That's it. That's six fights right there. Yeah, and the fight bananas YouTube channel. Literally directly right after the fights, we go live. Fight Bananas YouTube channel. Fight Bananas, that's where what we are presented by. Um, also, this show was brought to you by Sheath Underwear. Go to sheathunderwear.com. Find any underwear. They're all comfortable. They're all great. They're amazing. 
Um, and use promo code coffee N, not and coffee N KOs. Um, use that promo code. You get 20% off your entire order. I promise you guys aren't going to be disappointed. The product is great, super comfortable. I'm wearing them right now. I love it. So make sure you go check that out. Um, and again, come hang out, hang out with us on Saturdays. You can find us at Coffee and KOs One on all social media platforms. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well at Coffee and KOs. And we will see you next week. I'm trying to find the outro. Here we go. See you guys. <laughs>